We'll uh, reconvene the public meeting of the Board of Curators and its continuance of the Health Affairs Committee and call upon the Curator Phillips, Chair of the Committee, to uh, lead us in this portion of the meeting. So we really have uh, uh, four topics to cover. The only action item today is the approval of minutes of the last meeting of the Health Affairs Committee, which was back in April, April 27th. Uh, the four things that we're going to cover are going to be a general overview from the interim CEO of MU Health, Jonathan Cartwright, uh, and then we'll have a discussion of quarterly report on finances, on compliance, uh, and a proposed amendment um, on the collected rules of the University Physicians, which is, uh, let's say, a subdivision, sub-entity of MU Health. Um, for those that haven't met uh, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan had previously been with MU Health and has now become the interim CEO of MU Health. And uh, uh, it's been a great success and has really stepped in uh, and the cooperation between MU Health and the med school has taken on a new and pleasing dimension. Jonathan, please uh, uh, give us a few remarks. Thank you, Curator Phillips. Uh, I am grateful uh, to the board uh, for the opportunity to serve uh, as interim uh, chief executive officer for MU Healthcare. MU Healthcare, this is a, a, a wonderful time. Uh, and uh, we are making excellent, excellent progress in both our clinical operations and our education and growing investments in our academic and research mission uh, in the School of Medicine. So thank you for that. And it's also been great to have the Health Affairs Committee support and governance of our overall healthcare mission for the MU, MU campus, but is also overall for the system. So thank you very much. Uh, Jennifer Dahl, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Dahl. Jennifer Dahl is the uh, executive director and controller for MU Healthcare. Uh, Brian Steinus uh, uh, resigned uh, this last month as our chief financial officer to become the chief financial officer at Northeast Georgia Medical Center. A great opportunity for Brian. Uh, we are in great hands, though, with Jennifer uh, in her role as the controller, and she has not missed a beat at all. Uh, as you're about to find out, 2017 uh, was a, a very strong year for MU Healthcare, uh, and we will continue to make major uh, investments, and, and I believe that our plans for 2018 are strong as well, and we'll, we will continue to make really very, very strong investments in our academic mission, uh, working with Dean Delafontaine. Uh, we have got some, very, I think, some excellent plans on how we're going to create uh, some very solid uh, transfer uh, of partnership of funding for, to support our academic uh, mission. And we're uh, critically, critically excited about that. So with that, I'm going to hand the ball off to Jennifer and to give us an update on how we're doing financially. Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here today. So in your uh, packets, I think you have the information that we're going to cover for the finance portion of this conversation. Um, within the finance section, we're going to cover four main topics. So I'll start out with your <clears throat> with the May 2017 year to date results. Uh, and then we'll cover the fiscal year 18 budget. Uh, and then going on to the fiscal year 18 capital budget. Uh, with the final topic being talking about the uh, support between MU Healthcare and all of the partners throughout the uh, MU community and uh, UM system. Uh, and so we will start with the FY17 results. Uh, this is shown on page three of your packet. And so um, up on the screen, you'll see it as well. So when we talk about our financial results, uh, we usually like to start with uh, where we are on our uh, patient care and volumes. Um, so I'm actually going to start with page four so we can talk a little bit about where our volumes are um, and where we're seeing some uh, successes with the in within the institution before we talk about the dollars. <clears throat> So what you see is the uh, volumes uh, within the institution, and this is for the whole consolidated institution, MU Healthcare, uh, the main campus, as well as at Women's and Children's and MOI, uh, and the MUPC location. 
Uh, so within um, all of those metrics, you'll see the discharges. We are running uh, ahead of budget as well as ahead of prior year by a little over 2%. On uh, inpatient and outpatient surgery, you'll see a little bit of variability between those two. Um, but when we looked at it from a combined perspective, we're running about 7% ahead of budget uh, as well as prior year. And so we're seeing good results in our surgical volumes, just uh, different types of cases being presented uh, than what we had planned. Our deliveries, which occur over at WCH um, at our Women's and Children's Hospital, uh, have seen some tremendous successes over the last two years, uh, and we continue to see um, a growth in the deliveries, and so we're 21 percent ahead of budget on our deliveries, um, and we always enjoy the babies and the stories about the babies. Those are our, uh, happy times for our patients, um, and so we're excited about that volume at that location. The NICU days, or those are our neonate uh, infants that we have within our facilities. Um, we see some growth in that as well uh, compared to budget. We're a little bit down from prior year. Those are some of our most precious patients that we serve, uh, and we tend to see them for longer lengths of time than some of our other patients. Uh, ER visits, we're continuing to see volume growth uh, within the ER visits. We're about 2% ahead of budget and 2% ahead of prior year. Uh, and so that's a, basically the front door of our facility where we get a lot of our patients um, basically presenting, uh, and then those uh, become our patients and inpatient stays. Uh, and so we like to see that consistency within the ER area. Patient days, you'll see uh, we have some growth from budget of about 7% and about 6% over prior year. Um, and then our last metric that we like to track is clinical visits. So clinic visits um, are a little bit under budget by about 1%, um, but we like to look at the prior year and we actually see growth from prior year of about 1.5%. So um, great volumes overall. Um, you know, we continue to have uh, strong uh, patient volumes and um, market share within the community and throughout mid-Missouri. So how does that translate to our financial results? Um, we'll go back a page uh, to page three, and so you can see where we ended up for the uh, 11 months ended May 2017. Um, on our net revenues, we're running uh, about 11% better than our budget, uh, and operating expenses are running about 4% uh, uh, over budget as well, as we invest in resources to provide that clinical care. Uh, so overall, our uh, change in net assets is running at 67 million, uh, and so it's a, a good for, year for us. And as we talk in a little bit about the capital budget, I'll talk a little bit about what do we use those resources for, and how do we tie those back into the clinical mission and what we need to do for the institution. Uh, and so we have some great results on that. Our financial ratios that we show at the bottom of the page, we like to look at those um, and also compare to the Moody's A-rated benchmarks, and you'll see that on the right-hand side of uh, your page and the screen. And so you'll see that most of our metrics, we're running better than budget as well as better than the Moody's A-rated um, listings that you see on the page. So days cash on hand, uh, we are running better than budget, and we're running a little bit below uh, the Moody's A-rated as we do invest in our institution um, to do some capital uh, expansion and capital purchasing, uh, and we use our funds to do that. Uh, and then the last one, our net days revenue and AR um, is trending a little bit higher than we uh, would like, but we continue to focus on that with our payers in order to keep that managed. Um, and we feel the 55 days is pretty well within uh, where we would want to be uh, and continue to look at that. So, so overall fiscal year 17 results um, are showing you know, positive trends and we look for that to continue through the June year end uh, that happens actually in about 10 days. Uh, so uh, good results for us. So any questions on 2017 results before we turn to budget 18? <clears throat> I, I have one. Um, I noticed that the original budget for this year was 3% in terms of the margin percentage. And the actual year to date is 7.9%, mm -hmm. which is kind of a remarkable improvement over budget. That's correct. I understand that the national trend is fewer days in the hospital. Uh, so much of this is generated by inpatient days and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, any th other than births, too, I understand. You have a great increase in births. But uh, the, the tremendous uh, 
strength uh, that is carrying into this year. What are your thoughts about um, uh, why that is occurring here? It, it, it's, uh, it's really a strong year so far. Yeah, most of it is really due to the inpatient volume, like you said, as we get the inpatient volume coming in, as well as our surgical volume. Um, the surgical volume is, you know, really what helps uh, drive a lot of what we do, um, and it adds to our inpatient stays as well. And so even though we're seeing a little bit difference between the inpatient and outpatient volume, um, it does, you know, drive a lot of that revenue for us. Uh, and so that's a, a big area for us is, is the surgical volume as well as overall uh, patient days. Thank you. So we don't have a lot of um, changes in um, you know, our, our revenue relationships with either the federal government or the state, uh, they continue to be fairly consistent at this point. I guess the new bill is going to be introduced today for discussion. Uh, any other questions on this portion of the financial report? I have a question, and, and sorry if this is a novice question, but looking at your actual change in net assets, you had budgeted $25 million for the year, but you've spent $67 million. Were, were there, was there a special project there or something that led to that increase in the, the change of assets than you had budgeted? So the change in net assets is directly driven off of our um, increase in net revenues being about 11% better than budget um, and the management of our expenses being only about 4% over budget. So that differential between you know basically managing our costs um, but having increased revenues has led to that added um, change in net assets that we see are basically our profitability at the end. And so most of it is volume driven and we look at that every month to make sure, you know, um, is the increase that we're seeing, you know, based on volume or is it a one time event? Um, we do also see, um, I don't know if I see Tom Richards in the audience, but we do see um, better than budgeted experiences in our investments. Uh, we had only budgeted about a $2 million return on investments, and right now we're seeing about 14. And so that $12 million comes straight to the bottom line for us, and so that's a big category for us as well. That's kind of a different transaction uh, than our day-to-day -day operations transactions, um, and we're always thankful for that. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Real, real quick, the change in net assets, <coughs> to be clear, I, I think it's important to understand that's a governmental accounting term. So change in net assets in the private sector is just like your net income. So that's your bottom line. Right. So they're seeing significant bottom line improvement. All right. Uh, we will continue on uh, to the next part, which is the operating budget for 2018. So you'll see that on page six um, of your uh, packets. So as we go through the budget process every year, we have a pretty extensive process that starts in about uh, December as we uh, work on building um, our assumptions for our budget. And it's really a collaborative process between the clinical um, mission as well as uh, you know looking at academic and research. And we definitely partner with our clinical um, uh, physicians as we go through that. So the start of the process is to look at um, our utilizations and what we're expecting for volumes of patient care. We look at things like our market share and make sure that we understand our market share, changes in our market, uh, changes in demographics. So we go through that process um, for a good month to determine what we would have as pre pre the predictions for volumes. Those are then shared with our uh, clinical leaders. Uh, we meet with each of the uh, clinical chairs of each of the departments and discuss those volumes so that um, we're in direct partnership with those clinical leaders on where we think we're going as an institution. So as we proceed with that conversation, uh, we get into the actual dollars uh, and start building our budget. And so the information that you see on the screen really starts at the bottom of the page with the clinical volumes. Uh, so those are our key volume metrics. Uh, we track a lot of metrics, as you said, as you saw in the 2017 data, um, but these are the ones we'll highlight today. So when we go over this with our physician partners, it's you know, very important for us to understand maybe what we have as changes in services, changes in physician staffing, um, and then also that market. And so you'll see the discharges that we have budgeted for fiscal year uh, 18 um, compared to what we'll call the run rate or projected 17, which is the far right column, um, we're predicting about a 0.3% uh, increase in discharges. So we're not predicting a large increase in that, uh, in the discharge category. 
Uh, with surgeries, looking at that same run rate, uh, we're actually predicting about a 5% increase in uh, surgical volume. Uh, and that would be inpatient and outpatient volume. Uh, the ER visits, we're actually predicting a small decline, almost 2% decline in our ER visits. Um, this is partly driven by uh, the renovation and expansion that we're doing of the ER uh, of our main hospital. We actually did a groundbreaking on that facility uh, last week, and so we've started the construction. If you go uh, past the main hospital, you'll see some construction barriers up with the ER. Um, and we've actually are routing people through a different um, path in order to come into our ED. And as a result of that, we have predicted uh, some decline in that volume um, as the kind of front of our business has moved a little bit to the west side. So we also uh, predicted in that a little bit of an increase in volume at WCH uh, as we do have an ER over at that location. But on a combined basis, we're about a 2% decline from where we are today. Uh, patient days, we've also uh, predicted about a 2.5% decrease from where we are um, in our current run rate. That is uh, driven off of a couple of things. One, the ED visits uh, that will be that we predicted to decline um, generally translate into, um, I think it's about 40% uh, of our inpatient days. Uh, and so as you have that volume decrease in our ED, we're seeing, uh, predicting also a small decrease in the number of patient days. Um, another thing that we are looking at uh, is always quality of care and making sure we're providing the best quality of care. And one of those things is making sure that our patients stay within our facilities for the right amount of time. So we are seeing a little bit of an increase, about a half a day increase um, in some of our uh, areas, such as our uh, psychiat psychiatric unit um, and our peds unit that we're seeing about you know, that half a day of additional stay that we um, would normally have predicted. And so we're working on several initiatives uh, to de decrease that length of stay and get the patients home uh, sooner than what we are today. And so that's another thing that reflects in that change in patient, patient days from what we're experiencing today. Clinic visits, uh, we are actually predicting almost a 1% increase from where we are uh, in fiscal year 17. And uh, that's our ambulatory care as we have kind of those outpatient visits and those individuals uh, coming to our clinics. So as you look at those volumes um, and then look back at the top of that page, you'll see our revenues that we have budgeted. So uh, we budgeted actually almost a four million increase from our current run rate um, because we are predicting our volumes really to stay fairly flat um, you know, overall because uh, we did see some ups and downs within our volumes. So we're about $4 million over uh, what we're running today on our revenues. On the operating expenses, um, we're actually uh, looking to invest uh, in our institution through several things that I'll explain. Uh, and so you'll see the operating expenses are running about $50 million higher than where we are today. Uh, and so the things that we're planning on investing in, and as we go through our budget process and have our collaborative uh, conversations with physician leaders, we have physicians in the room, uh, we've got you know folks like myself, accountants in the room, uh, but also our uh, operations folks as we talk about where do we need to invest our resources. So one of our key resources, just like the rest of the university, is personnel. And so making sure that we have the right personnel in the right place is very important for us, um, particularly at the bedside. Uh, as well as in the ambulatory care or the clinics. Uh, and so we are planning on investing substantially in uh, our staffing and making sure that we have the staff in the right places at the right time. Uh, and so within that 50 million uh, change from our current run rate, uh, about 30 million of it is investing in salaries and benefits of our staff. Um, whether that is adding staffing um, or we do have some retention programs that we started uh, this past spring in order to uh, recruit as well as retain uh, those individuals to the bedside. And so we are investing uh, several million dollars in recruitment efforts uh, as we look to add um, anywhere from 200 to 400 um, to the bedside um, and to those clinic units uh, so that we can have the individuals that we need. Um, and so that's a big investment for us. The other pieces that we're investing in, uh, we do see an increase in supplies, uh, our medical supplies going up by about seven million. 
Um, we have some consulting costs that we will be incurring of about eight million. Um, about five million of that is for uh, affiliations that we are um, looking at at this time, as well as the possible um, replacement of our revenue cycle system uh, with the Cerner-based revenue cycle system. Right now we have a uh, third-party vendor for our revenue cycle, uh, that is GEIDX, and we are working on a transition to the Cerner system. Uh, and so that is included in our budgeted costs. Um, an additional item that we have uh, is about six million um, for some investments in uh, non-capital items, so smaller pieces of uh, equipment uh, that we need within the facility, as well as repairs and maintenance of our uh, of our various facilities and equipment. Uh, and so that should make up about the f the 50 million uh, variance that you see in operating expenses. So overall, uh, we're looking at a total um, change in net assets, or uh, like Ryan had said, our profitability of about $35 million uh, for fiscal year 18. So and I will open it up for questions. Bill? Chairman, I have I, one question. I'm, I'm really glad you went into explaining that Absolutely. $50 million because that number stuck out mm -hmm. as uh, not very good. If you just look at the right. basic page, but by explaining what you're doing uh, makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. You anticipate, let's say, the next year, though, doing some of those similar things again? I mean, if we continue to do that, aren't we, aren't we regressing rather than making progress if we continue to do that kind of expenditures? Yeah, good Jennifer, question. Jennifer um, you know, and, and stabilizing and, and making sure that we're accountable for um, all of, you know, uh, what we need to do is uh, definitely something that we're looking at. So um, in general, you know, we're, and I'll let Jonathan speak as well, um, you know, we do look at, you know, how many beds we're going to have available. Are we bringing more beds online within the facility? Um, so do we need more staffing? You know, if we're bringing the staffing in order to um, accommodate more beds, such as we're going to be adding about 22 to our uh, MOI location, we'll have those um, staffs that we will need to maintain in future years as well. Some of the things that we do want to look at um, managing uh, is our contracted costs and overtime. Right now, our contracted costs, uh, which would be um, our temporary labor, uh, and our overtime is running about 8% of our salaries, and we would prefer that to be in the range of 3 to 5% instead of the 8%. And so we're really, you know, changing costs um, because we do want to, you know, have full-time staff. They're more invested in our organization uh, when they are employed uh, versus the temporary staff, and so you know, we're looking at, at that as well. And so we like to manage that cost in order to make sure that we stay in line. So, but Jonathan has some additional comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, a, a couple of things. Uh, we are uh, bucking most national trends. Uh, most uh, major healthcare systems, their inpatient discharges and surgeries are actually dropping. The fact that we are actually increasing by 1% is, is a significant improvement over most places uh, nationally. Uh, I freely admit, uh, Curious Snowden, we cannot keep our expense increase up. Uh, we are making major investments uh, to um, get us to work correctly staffed. Uh, as Jennifer alluded to, we have got many, many uh, empl uh, temporary employees in our nursing staff, and, and I, uh, it's my goal that we would eliminate that. Uh, it's incredibly expensive, and the quality uh, of full-time employees that are on your team is actually is, is a known fact nationally that, that it improves if you have your own staff uh, on board. So these are major investments we're making. Uh, I, I would, uh, no, it's major investments we're making, and we, I freely admit we will not keep this in, uh, the expense increase up. I'm glad you both elaborated on that. I think it's a lot clearer now. Thank you. Any further questions on this portion? Okay, we'll move on okay. to the we'll capital. Continue on to the capital budget page. So as I mentioned when we were talking about the FY17 results um, that uh, we 
are showing a change in net assets through May of about $67 million. Um, and it's uh, just a coincidence that that's what shows on this page. But um, what we do with those uh, funds as we have profitability each year is we try to reinvest in the institution. Um, you know, through staffing is one thing, as we talked about that, but the other is um, to actually invest in our facilities uh, and our equipment. And so we do a budget every year. Um, for capital and we actually do a three-year budget to where we look out um, and we have uh, some predictions of what we'll need for our fiscal year 19 and 20 um, as we look at the whole institution and where we need to go. Um, but we're showing you three uh, years here, two historical and one for FY18 so you can kind of see where we are spending those funds. Um, so we generally have to invest in our uh, physical plant and those are kind of the first two uh, or actually three categories that you see. Um, we're, we're investing mainly in space that we already have constructed um, and own uh, or lease and so uh, we're spending a significant amount keeping our facilities at the level that we need to in order to provide quality care. Um, we're also uh, always investing in our technology and so we have um, always looking at, you know, working with Cerner to invest in uh, the best technology that we can uh, to help our clinicians uh, provide that service to our patients. Um, major medical equipment is a big category for us as well as we look to invest in the equipment that is needed in patient care. Uh, and so we provided at the bottom of that sheet a couple of examples of things that we have done um, over time and what we are planning for this next fiscal year. So uh, a couple of the renovations that we've done in the past, uh, renovating the patient visitor garage, uh, as well as renovating some of the older floors of our uh, primary facility, um, the fourth, fifth, and seventh floors, when we opened the new patient care tower, we went back and we actually said we need to renovate the spaces that um, you know, have been there since the 1950s. Uh, so we've done those. Uh, we are actually now working on finishing um, out some of the shelled space that we had uh, in the patient care tower on floors three and four. Uh, some of the new plan construction uh, that I mentioned, you see some of it already. The MOI expansion is going to be finishing this fall. And then we are wa working on the ED expansion uh, at the main facility. Uh, the major medical equipment uh, that we'll be doing uh, is some MRIs and CTs as we expand those facilities and add those, um, or we replace the ones that we have today if they are out of uh, their life cycle. And so those are the types of things we invest in. So we're planning on investing $67 million into the facilities and the equipment um, in order to provide that patient care. So any questions on that? One quick question, Jennifer. I noticed there's a, a <coughs> to the FY18 budget on a new construction, there's zero. Is that zero? Um, so the new construction associated with the ED is a combination of renovation and uh, new uh, that we're adding to the front of the main facility and renovating a couple of the floors to accommodate <clears throat> it. Uh, and so that is actually blended together in the facility renovations number, uh, the ED renovation. So. Yes. So we, yes, we have new, but we have, it's hard to parse it apart, um, I would say. I, I think it's uh, safe to say also the new construction is uh, basically phase two of MOI that, will, that will, it will be completed this fiscal year. So that's where our last major new construction has been brought on board. But between MOI phase two, as well as some of the renovation of our existing facilities, we expect that there could potentially be 40 to 50 incremental beds uh, that we will start to see the fruit of that, uh, hopefully this year and the following years. If, if I could, would you remind me how how have those uh, been financed with the health department? I mean the health, not the health department, um, MU Health. Are those bonds, MU Health bonds, you rely on the university bonding capacity? How, how, how Ryan, you want to? Do you want me to take that one? Oh, yeah, Ryan, okay. Facilities bonds for the entire system. Um, I think there's about 316 million that's associated with MU Health on our 1.7 billion in outstanding debt. Uh, all of MU Health revenue is pledge revenue for the purpose of system facilities bonds. So, I do have a question. Yes. Um, so the news has reported that the uh, ED expansion or renovation is going to cost about 18 million, mm -hmm. and I'm looking again at what Phil raised. Uh, so, so if you look in, so is it in the 
fiscal year 17 budget? Is that where it's blended in? We have a little bit of it in the fiscal year 17 budget, some in 18, and then it will uh, finish in 19. And so that 18 million is spread over three years. Right. And so you're just looking at what we're predicting as the FY uh, 17 and 18 spend um, in those categories. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Good question. So. Any, any other questions? Now we have our fourth topic, and that is uh, MU health support for the medical school and sciences. Okay. Um, yes, moving on to the fourth topic uh, in your packet, starts on page uh, 10. So uh, this particular uh, analysis we wanted to bring to the group uh, to show the support that is provided between MU Healthcare um, and our partners throughout the university um, as that we do uh, provide funding as well as use resources of the different campuses um, here in Columbia, and so I'll explain the schedule a little bit. Uh, so the first part of the schedule, the first three columns, show the support that we have to the School of Medicine uh, as we partner with the school as well as buy resources from the school, and I'll explain that in a moment. Um, we have some support as well uh, to um, the schools of nursing and schools of health profession, and then there is support that is also paid to Columbia campus and to UM system. Uh, so the portions that we pay uh, that you'll see on that page, it's um, columns uh, seven and eight uh, that say payments to UM system and payments to Columbia campus. Those are payments that we make as we buy services from uh, those partner entities here in Columbia. So it could be things like um, paying for our insurance uh, that we um, buy or, or that we pay for within the risk and insurance department, paying for administrative services uh, within um, legal counsel, uh, within the accounting functions, uh, within HR, uh, as they provide support to all of our employees, as well as to uh, all employees of the university. So the payments to Columbia campus include things like the purchase of utilities, um, anything that is located on the main campus, uh, such as our main facility, MOI, MUPC, and the new patient care tower. Uh, we buy all of our utilities from the Columbia campus. Uh, so they provide our electricity, all of our chilled water, um, et cetera. And so uh, we do buy externally uh, for our women's and children's facilities as well as some of our clinics. But those main facilities are, are uh, purchased from Columbia campus. And so that's what you see in those categories as we buy those um, from our partners. So um, I think what we really want to focus on is our support to our schools. Uh, and so back on the first three columns, you'll see the support that we pay to uh, the School of Medicine. And uh, so you can look at back in 2012, we provided about 39 million in support to the School of Medicine uh, versus what we're projecting in uh, 2017, which is about 63 million. And so we've increased our support to the school through several mechanisms uh, that you'll see on the page. The first is our payments for our program that we call CARTS. This is our uh, support of the clinical research and, acad and uh, education mission uh, that the school provides. And so it covers things like um, providing compensation to um, uh, our uh, faculty as they work to provide that supervision to our residents um, and uh, also you know, provide support for the clinical programs such as anesthesia and the ED. Um, as they have that patient care that they're providing for the hospital. And so that's what we see in that CARTS category. We continue to increase CARTS every year um, to help pay for those costs. We are estimating, uh, or we have budgeted for fiscal year 18 for that to be $46.5 million. Uh, the next is the payments to the School of Medicine that's above CARTS. As we proceed through the year, um, the CARTS funding is not a hard and fast number as we continue to negotiate every uh, day uh, with the school and talk about different needs that they have um, or different needs that we may have and ask for our part clinical partners to come to the table and provide that support. And so we continue to um, you know, see those different things that we'll need to support each year. And so we've got about $4 million, uh, that we'll be providing above that CARTS number in fiscal year. Uh, 17, and that's probably a run um, on average, you know, right around 3 million each year. 
Uh, the next column is the performance-based support program. This is a program that we started back in 2013 in order to um, share in the benefits that um, end up being the change in net assets for MU Healthcare. Uh, and so we do have a program where we're sharing that with our uh, school partners. Um, and so we're looking at things currently. Uh, we've looked at certain metrics of quality. Uh, we might look at things like mortality, um, readmissions, as well as overall profitability of the institution. And so we continue to look at that um, each year. For this year, you see on your page, uh, we had estimated it to be about 15 million that will be provided in fiscal year 17. Um, Jonathan and I looked at this yesterday and we're actually predicting that to be closer to 17 million for fiscal year 17. For fiscal year um, 18, we continue with that program, uh, but we have changed that to be uh, $10 million of guaranteed support to the school uh, with a component that is more of what we might call the at risk based on um, performance and quality. And so we anticipate that again to be uh, at least 15 million that we would be providing in that category in fiscal year 18. Um, so those are the support uh, categories for the School of Medicine um, as we continue to par partner with them uh, as well as Dr. Dallafontaine. Um, the support to the Columbia campus that you see that's budget support, that was um, a one-time support that we have provided in this fiscal year um, as the campus has experienced reductions in state funding and we've provided a $3 million support to the campus. So the schools of nursing and health profession, we have various conversations with those leaders, uh, with Dean Miller and Dean Haglin uh, to support their pro programs, whether it's an accelerated uh, um, bachelor's of nursing program uh, within nursing or the programs within the school of health professions. Uh, and so overall, the support, if you look at all in, uh, is about $116 million. Any questions? Curator Steelman. Payments to the medical school have, have gone up uh, quite significantly, and the payments to the School of Nursing has almost stayed uh, level, as uh, uh, is true of the payments to the School of Health Professions. And can you explain what is that uh, difference attributable? Is it number of uh, staff or employees? Is it salaries have gone up much higher in the School of Medicine? What's Why that big distinction? Yeah, the support for the School of Medicine, particularly the um, CARTS piece, is you know driven some by the uh, clinical growth as we add more faculty um, and we provide support to uh, the faculty as they provide the clinical care, we see that uh, grow, as well as we've added residents over time. So the more residents that we have, uh, the more support that we pay for them to provide that supervised um, uh, clinical support to those residents, and so that's what you see in the CARTS column. The biggest increase for the School of Medicine is that performance-based support program that we added in 2013, and so that's the biggest piece that we see of, of that increase over time. The School of Nursing... What exactly is that? Is that, is that an incentive program? Yes. Um, I'm hesitant because I'm looking at my uh, legal partners. Um, it is a program of, of sharing in the net assets of the institution um, based on you know whether we perform our profitability, whether we perform uh, quality, um, and so it's a profit sharing program, you might say. And who shares in that? Uh, so the funds are provided to uh, the office of the dean of the School of Medicine. Uh, and the dean and the CEO of the institution collaborate to determine the allocation of those funds and resources um, as needed throughout the School of Medicine. This might be a question for the dean. Do we factor in research into that, or, or is this uh, maybe uh, counter to research? Uh, yeah, uh, so let me, uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to uh, um, give you some explanations about this. So. Um, you know, the answer about research um, is that, no, it's, it's a great supporter of research, and so this is really support that we can get into the academic mission. Um, let me take a moment to explain a little bit the, the different categories there. So CART support is a historical term. Um, it stands for Clinical Administrative Research Teaching and Service Support. It actually should be called CATS. Um, uh, because there is no direct support of research. Um, 
card support is, essentially supports the clinical mission. And so as our clinical faculty number grow, we get proportional increase in CAT support, if you will, to support the new clinical faculty, their time in teaching and their time in medical directorships. So that really supports, to a large extent, the clinical mission, although there's some support for the teaching time of the clinical faculty. And the strategic component of that is really uh, targeting dollars to strategic service lines that we want to grow. Uh, and so in our strategic plan, together with the hospital, over the last couple of years, we've decided we're going to focus heavily on cardiovascular oncology. Um, as far as our service lines. And so um, the strategic component of CARTS or CATS is focused on those service lines, not exclusively, but largely. If you look at performance-based support, performance-based support has historically in our system been calculated as a percentage of the net profit, if you will, of the hospital. Now, remember, hospital profits and medical school profits are really one and the same thing. The hospital profits are driven by the clinical faculty that are, are essentially medical school faculty. That's what drives the hospital profits. And so we have a system, and it's a good system, where we share in the profits of that. We've called it performance-based support, but it should really be called academic support because these funds are used largely to support the academic mission. That is, um, startup packages for new chairs, investment into research programs, investment into new research space, and, and other initiatives that are very tied to the research mission. We do allocate a small percentage of those funds historically to non-productivity-based metrics. And what I mean by that is physicians are paid um, to a large extent on their clinical productivity, but as healthcare nationally has mo is moving away from simply a fee-for-service system to a, uh, a value-based system, physician compensation plans are trying to include non-productivity-based metrics, such as patient satisfaction, mortality, readmission rates, et cetera. And so a small component of our performance-based support has historically been allocated to drive those non-productivity-based metrics of patient satisfaction, uh, quality, if you will. Um, but to a large extent, they are uh, supporting the academic mission. <laughs> One of the challenges we've had historically with our system of calculating that, and I think this year we're going to do much better because Jonathan and I have come up, I think, with a much better uh, way to structure these payments is, so one of the, the difficulties is they were all on the bottom line. So if the, um, uh, the uh, operating budget was relatively high, uh, because we're including um, days cash in hand growth in that, even if the hospital did well, that delta could be relatively small. And so we, we had no way of knowing what was our performance-based support going to be. And what most schools have done, most academic medical centers around the country have done, is they include a fixed or guaranteed payment before the bottom line. And so this year we have done that, so we've taken... Um, 10 million, and that is now a guaranteed support from the hospital to the medical school for academic support, and then we will still share, we will ha still have a share of the bottom line profits, um, which in our case is going to be around 40%, at least up to a maximum of 15 million, and then it will drop down to 10%. But by putting in a fixed payment of 10 million up front, it's much easier for me to know as far as recruitment of new research faculty, academic faculty, how can I structure um, packages, how can I make plans for expansion of our research enterprise, having that predictable support is a huge plus. And this is sort of the state-of-the-art way that it's done around the country, and I think we are now finally getting to 
a system that is state of the art in our health in our health system. So I've got to say uh, kudos to Jonathan and his team for working with us to facilitate this. If I could just ask further, is that okay? Sure, Mr. Chairman. Because frankly, one of my concerns in the past, and what I have been told by members of the faculty, is that the incentive system incentivized more clinical production, and they felt disincentivized uh, research. So rather than get too complicated, because I know you and, 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 and uh, Mr. Kurtwright have really made some great strides in this, but do you feel, uh, as dean and, and, and research falling to a great extent on your shoulders, that you now have the financial tools to where you can incentivize research uh, and not disincentivize it through these sort of uh, Yes, um, absolutely. I think this very much helps to incentivize research. Now, I'm not going to get into the weeds for this meeting, but obviously there are still continuing challenges, you know, uh, research funding nationally. The fact that the cap on, you know, a NIH salary is well below that of many of our clinicians. So those, you know, those challenges are national challenges that all medical schools have. This type of arrangement really facilitates, though, now incentivizing the research component of our mission. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, let me, let me follow up on that. You talk about $10 million is fixed now. That number doesn't show up any place on that. It. It's actually, is it included in the 15 million that's shown at the bottom? Uh, yes, it is. And uh, it, it is included in the 15 million. Now for this fiscal year 17, we're at the end of that year, this new system of fixed payments was not put into effect. We've arrived at this for fiscal year 18. And in fiscal year 18, that fixed payment will, will, will actually take place and it'll be part of the 15 million if you will okay so if that's true and you, and you got 15 million there if you look at the 2016 you were at 15 million 250 and then the year before 15 million 110 what's the difference I mean it looks like it's about the same number right so I would say that um, the estimate for f fiscal year 17 is probably going to be closer to 17 million than 15 million Okay. Why, um, didn't we put, why didn't we put that in there then, if that's true? So that was based on what we had projected uh, through April, uh, and when we submitted the materials, we hadn't closed May. So when we look at our projection more through May, uh, we actually look at 17 million. All right. And you know, I like your explanation, and it sounds like we are making progress there and doing a much better job. Uh, but to, if you just looked at this chart and these numbers. It doesn't look like it's any different. Right. I think what is very different, and it's not there because we haven't broken it down, obviously. We're giving you the lump sum of 15 here. Okay. But what's really different is that going forward, two-thirds of that 15 will be a guaranteed payment. It will come off as an expense to the hospital, a transfer to the medical school before getting to net operating revenue. So it's a guaranteed payment. And that's a big difference as far as our books, because it's predictable. I like what I'm hearing. I guess I didn't like what I saw. That's all. <laughs> Patrick, I had, a, I had a question. Sure. Going back over to uh, the payments to the School of Medicine above CARTS or CATS. Uh, that varies. Uh, is that the result of a defined process uh, or the result partly of negotiation? How do you get to those figures? Because they do vary from year to year. Are you talking about the performance-based support? The, I can the, the second that column. The, the second column? Dr. Delfontaine. The medicine above CATS or CARTS. Yes, that is driven. Um, I can do that one. Yeah, you may want to. OK, yeah. um, I can answer that one. So uh, that's based on uh, some uh, basically negotiations throughout the year of different things that we need to do. So a good example uh, is within CARTS, uh, we provide support for the uh, Department of Anesthesia, uh, Anesthesiology. And so as that uh, clinical volume increases in surgeries, 
the need to support a department like anesthesiology grows. So we start out with a set amount that we are predicting at the beginning of the year, and then by the end of the year, we'll look at that and we'll say, do we need to provide more support for that department? Um, and that's what ends up in that column, is as we look at those departments that we do support, and if they need additional support by the end, that was not quite the same as what we had predicted and budgeted, uh, is how we get that in there. So the ED is um, another one that we'll support. We have other uh, clinical areas that we've added support based on uh, conversations with the school and, and needs to, pro to support those clinical departments. But the anesthesiology is the easiest one to kind of explain. Thank you. But we've touched on some critical issues here. And, and the primary thing, this, this is a conversation that's been going on for a few years, is to get more in the guaranteed column uh, and less discretionary uh, so that the medical school and the other professions can rely upon things going into the future. You can't recruit new faculty, if I'm thinking correctly here, without them having a fund to support the research and the team they bring with them, but more than a year. Uh, and it used to be discretionary, and so it did jump up in 2015. Mm -hmm. I guess what this is all great news, and it's kind of a breakthrough in terms of the cooperation between the med school and MU Health. Uh, but it would be good in the future to have some further guarantee than just in in uh, June saying the upcoming budget. Uh, there is a guarantee of $10 because you can't bank on that on an ongoing basis. Now, nothing is forever, but the discretionary columns, um, this is really discretionary. In fact, when you were speaking, you said uh, that it's really negotiated every day with clinical partners is the terms that you use. So it is quite discretionary right, between MU Health mm -hmm. and the med school, whereas the column uh, of the uh, performance-based, a guarantee for one year, so I guess the, we can discuss, because we'll have another Medical Affairs Committee meeting, we can discuss how to build in the ability of the medical school and the other health professions to be able to plan for more than one year mm -hmm. of enough funds to fund the research. And for the audience and for anybody that hasn't heard this before, medical school in particular, but also nursing and others, are dependent on we're dependent on them having research to say in the AAU and to make MU Health the quality system that it is by bringing in top flight researchers. It, so, so great progress, and, and I just wanted to comment uh, on this. I had the same problem that Phil did when I looked at this, at the final edition of this slide, because I didn't fully comprehend that at least for next year we have a guarantee um, but we, we need more than a year's planning to, to keep up a quality med school. I made that comment, and, and I guess I'd be interested if uh, Jonathan um, or Patrick have uh, any response to that. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, in regard to the School of Nursing and the School of Health Professions, uh, Career Steelman, uh, Dr. Miller is back here. Uh, I think that we need to ensure that we're making major investments in the School of Nursing a as well. Uh, the School of Nursing and the School of Health Professions are, are absolutely critical feeder streams uh, to our organization. A major growth uh, limiting step right now is, is not actually space, it's the number of nurses that we have. And so kudos to uh, our Sinclair School of Nursing, it's frankly one of the best in the United States, uh, and, and we need to make major investments in that we can do more, and, and I think that that was a good feedback, and we accept that uh, graciously. Uh, in, in, terms of, in terms of support to the School of Medicine, it's absolutely critical that we make major investments in our School of, of Medicine. Uh, we, most academic center, medical centers that are just doing great uh, figure out ways to invest in both the academics as well as the clinical practice. We will be one of those organizations. Uh, we have major aspirations to become a, a National Cancer Institute, <coughs> NCI designated cancer center, as well as to make major improvements in our, in our NIH extramurally funded research 
and we will be making major investments in doing that. And, and I uh, absolutely uh, take it uh, as, as the leader of the clinical enterprise that we will be making those investments to ensure that uh, uh, we're growing our academic mission uh, appropriately. Great. Any further questions on, on, I think this is the final portion of your topic. Yep, there's additional slides for additional information in your packet, um, but that was the bulk of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have one more piece, which I hope we can be short. We may actually be over time for our committee, and that is Jennifer Day, uh, who is the acting uh, chief compliance officer for MU Health. And we, uh, we have an obligation to, uh, you know, fairly uh, rigid obligations in reporting to the federal government, and she's going to cover that briefly for us. Thank you very much, Curator Phillips. Thank you to all the curators today. And thank you for giving us this time to give you the MU Health quarterly <coughs> compliance update. Uh, as of June 30th, which is next Friday, we will be at the end of our first reporting period under the Corporate Integrity Agreement that we signed last summer. Uh, we have an annual report that is due to the Office of Inspector General at the end of August. So I'd like to spend the next few minutes with you today just reviewing the compliance program in general uh, throughout the year and on the activities of the program throughout the past year. So our Office of Corporate Compliance and our Executive Compliance Committee have been very active this year in reviewing the implementation of and our status related to each element of the Corporate Integrity Agreement. We've also been assessing and for the Executive Compliance Committee advising on the overall compliance program. So you have a document in your packets today uh, that outlines a number of those items and, and the steps that we've taken throughout the year for you. And so I'd like to spend the next few moments just highlighting a few of those for you. I'd be happy to take questions about any of them as well. So our Executive Compliance Committee has completed an assessment of the compliance governance process, including their role in the process, as well as all of their subcommittees that they hear from on a regular basis, and looking at all the other inputs that they receive information about our compliance program from. They've received updates from their subcommittees throughout the year, and they'll continue to do so going forward. And they have been briefed on the status of all the obligations under the Corporate Integrity Agreement. As you know, that Corporate Integrity Agreement has a number of obligations, and so I'd like to look at two of those for you today and highlight some of our activities around those for you. One of the major obligations of the, the Corporate Integrity, Integrity Agreement is the training program that we have put into place. Uh, the agreement itself has very specific training requirements that were outlined uh, for us. The result and what that means for us at MU Health is that we were able to put together more compliance training for all of our staff. We launched in November an online training module set for them to review, and by May of 2017, all of our employees had completed that training. We also worked very closely with our Human Resources Office to make sure that we were receiving updates and continue to receive updates regularly on new employees so we can get them into that system and get them through the training as well. Another part of the Corporate Integrity Agreement's obligations for us was a, a robust disclosure program. Prior to the signing of the agreement, University of Missouri System had already established the Ethics and Compliance Hotline, and so we were lucky because we were able to leverage that program to serve as the phone and online reporting system for all of our employees to report any concerns that they have. Uh, MU Health went on to establish an MU Health Hotline Committee because we wanted to take a very close look at our processes that were really related to the hotline and managing those processes. In particular, we wanted to make sure we were receiving the reports in a timely manner, that we were investigating them, and that we were documenting our investigation of those uh, reports fully. And also, we wanted to ensure we were reporting back to UM System, as UM System is the one that manages that hotline, not only for MU Health, but also for all the four campuses. So providing them the information back that they needed, as well as ensuring that we were providing communication back to the individuals that were making those reports. I'm pleased to say that we are very confident that our processes are solid around our hotline. Uh, we're gonna, going forward, we'll be continuing uh, this as a regular uh, update item for our Executive Compliance Committee on a regular basis. We also wanted to make sure that our hotline was well publicized, and so we ensured that our hotline is available and the information about how to access it is available on all of our websites. It's included in our daily e-newsletter that goes to all MU Health employees. 
It's in all of our training programs, and we talk about it at every new MU Health new employee orientation session that occurs. So that's a little update on some of the items related specifically to the CIA obligations. Just in general, our compliance program has continued to do what, what they've been doing over a number of years, and that includes performing regular auditing and monitoring. We established uh, last year a, a fiscal year 17 compliance plan, and so that plan has been in place and been working throughout the year. That has included uh, reviews such as our coding and documentation accuracy reviews on a regular basis for our coders as well as our providers. We've also provided regular reviews of some high risk areas such as our 340B drug pricing program, ensuring that that's in place. We also included in that plan a number of oversight and rules compliance checks to see uh, test some specific items. Included in that list on that plan were things like the uh, check of our notification processes for our comprehensive joint replacement program ensuring that the notifications for advanced beneficiary notifications was solid and working, looking at our infrastructure in place that we have for handling medical device credits, as well as checking in and working with our pathology department to ensure that their coding and billing was solid. Our compliance program generally also works with the MU Campus Office of Research, the Institutional Review Board, and the Office of Sponsored Programs Administration very, very closely. Uh, we do that to make sure that we are managing all the compliance aspects that are related to the research programs that go on uh, at MU Health and within the schools. One of those specific examples is uh, coverage analyses and billing reviews that we conduct uh, regularly for approximately 300 clinical trials. So looking forward to FY18, we have completed our risk assessment process, which is also an element under the corporate integrity agreements. That process has now been completed for this year and, and help us plan for FY18. We do that in conjunction with internal audit services at UM System, so it's a nice collaborative process and a good way for us to reach out to all of our partners and ensure that we're talking regularly about the concerns that they have and including those uh, items within our reports. That will be uh, finalized, our, our compliance plan aspect of that will be finalized within the next uh, month. We're working on the final touches of that and the Executive Compliance Committee will see that next month at their meeting. In addition to the quarterly reports that this body receives uh, through the Health Affairs Committee, I will be meeting regularly with President Choi to ensure that he is up to speed on the compliance program and our activities both uh, generally but also under the Corporate Integrity Agreement. And our Executive Compliance Committee will be meeting monthly to help support the program as well and ensure that we're moving forward. The next few months we will be focused uh, very heavily on that annual report that's gonna be going to the Office of Inspector General. So that's gonna be our activities over the next few months. Just in summary, um, we are on track to complete the requirements of the Corporate Integrity Agreement for year one. We're very ready to move forward and we're always gonna be looking forward to improve our compliance program overall. Questions? Can I Thank you for your good work in filling in as acting in this capacity. Um, any questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> Finally, um, we have a brief presentation by Dr. Theodore Choma on, I think, three different topics where uh, he has been chairing a group to talk about some updates to the CRRs, particularly 440.040, um, which haven't been revised since 1980. And these cover university physicians, which is the actually the, the group that uh, through which uh, salaries are paid of physicians and perhaps others. So Dr. Choma, please walk us through. This is an information item, no action required today. Thanks and good morning. Uh, I'm Ted Choma. I'm an orthopedic surgeon and I'm the chairman of our university physicians practice group. Um, so as uh, Curator Phillips said, uh, with some background, in the 1970s, uh, our board of curators uh, created university physicians. Um, and, uh, and that group um, does the uh, contracting, billing, collecting, uh, uh, liability uh, coverage, uh, many of the, the aspects around the practice of medicine that we perform for um, uh, our patients here at the University of Missouri. When this was uh, written up in the 1970s, um, uh, 
it, it had been uh, amended or changed once in the 1980s, about 30 years ago, uh, and there have been no such uh, changes or updates since then. And this is informational for you all as we are uh, right now proposing some changes. <laughs> These uh, areas of change that we've identified uh, fall into three categories. The, the first is with um, uh, part-time faculty members, part-time clinical faculty members. The way the uh, original collected rules were written, it simply stated that university physicians would do all of the uh, billing and collecting for any faculty physician. It did not make um, any uh, allowance for a part-time faculty physician. Uh, who might have other uh, legitimate clinical business uh, in the state of Missouri. And so the proposed change in, uh, in this, uh, the way this is written would address that. It would identify that a full-time faculty physician is 0.75 FTE or greater. That's uh, in accordance with the entire system. And it would also uh, specify that the university physicians only makes a claim or takes assignment for the, that clinical activity that is done under the auspices of the university. It further clarifies that for these full-time uh, faculty physicians, um, they need to, if they intend to do any clinical moonlighting, they would need to obtain permission from their respective chairman and the dean of the School of Medicine. Second area is in the area of faculty resignation from the university. Uh, UM system policy requires two weeks notice from, uh, from an employee to resign in good standing. Um, but our, our, our management committee uh, believes that we physicians have a higher ethical duty to our patients. And so um, our, our proposed edit would state that uh, a UP physician would need to provide 60 days of written notice of resignation uh, in order to receive their last clinical incentive payout. Uh, we think that that uh, allows their supervisors and their partners the time that it would take to um, adequately uh, and hopefully seamlessly address the, the care needs for the patients who will be left without their uh, uh, physician. Uh, finally, if you read through uh, the collected rules uh, 440-040, um, it, it it identifies that each of our physicians will sign an assignment form uh, each year that simply restates that they are willingly assigning all of the billing and collecting uh, that is uh, uh, attributable to their clinical activity to university physicians. The way that the uh, collected rules were written, though, it, it, it pointed to an example document and made no provision for it to be updated or changed. And as you might imagine, over the years, there have been different regulatory changes, different uh, legal changes that, that are required in that, um, uh, in that form or contract each year. And so uh, our University Physician Management Committee has suggested that we simply allow for that, that, that we, we tell in our collected rules that our members will will have an assignment form that they will uh, assign, that they will sign each year, but that that may be updated annually. The process for this, uh, for changing the collected rules is partly uh, why uh, the collected rules haven't been changed in about 30 years. Um, it required uh, first that the management um, uh, committee vote on these changes and forward it to the entire membership. The management committee has done so. Now it's up to us to organize uh, a vote of the entire university physician uh, membership, which is, which is just under 600 physicians. We need to have um, a quorum, so we need to get a mail-in vote of uh, almost 300 of them, and two-thirds uh, will be required to assent to these changes. All those logistics uh, are met, then uh, these changes will be forwarded to the dean, the chancellor, and the president for their approval, and, um, and finally will be forwarded to you, the, the curators, uh, for your approval. I would anticipate or probably mid-July that we will open the voting for university physicians. It will be open over uh, the course of a few weeks while we attempt to uh, make sure that physicians are uh, adequately notified about uh, the opportunity and the responsibility to vote, 
as well as have time to uh, digest these proposed changes, uh, answer questions um, that may come up. Subject to your questions, that's all I have. Questions? So as far as final board approval, when would you suggest that might happen? Uh, my hope would be in the fall. Is there any indication that you've received from any physicians that any of this is particularly controversial or likely to? Uh... Yeah, not, not particularly. So I've sent, a, uh, I've sent an email with all these changes to all 600 of our physicians. I've had two respond to me with uh, small issues around them, um, uh, but, but no, no large issues. So on your third, uh, second proposal, uh, first I'm surprised that we're dealing with requirements of notice uh, by CRRs. It seems we do a lot of things by CRRs, but do you think it's necessary? I mean, if it's already in a CRR, you have to, you have to change it, I suppose, but those kinds of details you would normally uh, not have codified. I mean, it just surprises me that, that we're dealing with it at this level, and then to change that it requires board approval. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, uh, you'd have to, uh, you know, uh, you'd have to talk to, and I'm no HR uh, uh, expert, um, but uh, uh, my sense is, uh, is that uh, the system uh, was uh, uh, more interested in seeing the, the physicians address this um, amongst ourselves. And so, uh, and so you'll see that, that we're addressing this issue in, in two ways, but in parallel. So um, just, I think, uh, earlier this week, our medical staff, the university uh, hospital, medical staff executive committee also adopted a notice, a notification uh, measure that would state that uh, physicians who are on the medical staff need to give 60 days of notice of resignation unless waived by their chair, um, and, uh, and that if they did not do so, uh, an, if another hospital um, inquires about uh, credentialing, they would be told the, the physician did not leave in good standing. So, um, so what I think what you see is, is ECOMS or the medical staff uh, addressing this issue in, in within their purview, and this is U, UP's way of addressing it within within our purview. All right, sounds like you welcome it because it gives uh, empowers physicians subject to approval, so, so that's fine. Um, the other question I had on that same one was, is it reciprocal so that um, MU Health gives 60 days notice except in egregious circumstances to physicians who depart? Yeah, so. Uh, so our, our faculty physicians have a whole uh, palette of protections that are built in as, as any faculty member would, and that would depend on whether they're um, a tenure track or, or tenured or non-tenure track. And, um, and this university of physicians does not sort of get into that. Um, the, um, uh, the area where it might, uh, should we, um, uh, develop a large cohort of non-faculty physicians, then, then I think we, we'd have to address that issue. Of non? Non-faculty physicians. Non-faculty, tenure track or tenure. Or, or, or non-tenure track. We, we have a large, in fact, the largest cohort of our faculty physicians are non-tenure track. They are on uh, essentially year-to-year -year contracts. All right, any other questions? Hearing none, thank you very much for bringing this. We we'll look forward to hearing back from you after you go through the voting process. At this point, uh, as chair of the Health Affairs Committee, I would welcome from the committee uh, a, uh, a motion to approve the minutes of the April 27th uh, meeting of the Health Affairs Committee. So moved. Second. Cindy, would you call the roll? Mm -hmm. Curator Lehman? Yes. Ms. Malady? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. You have all votes in favor. And next, um, I would move as chair to adjourn the open session of the Health Affairs Committee. Need a second. Second. Thank you. Would you call the roll? Curator Lehman? Yes. Ms. Malady? 
Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. That's all, all Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, John, and thank you to the uh, Health Care's Affairs Committee. Uh, they've done a lot of work lately and still have a lot of work to do. We appreciate it. Next uh, item on the agenda, we'll move to the Finance Committee, chaired by Curator Steelman, the uh, committee members of which are Curator Chapman, Curator Lehman, and Curator Snowden. Uh, Steelman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're going to have two information items. Uh, they, one of them is the project design of, of the uh, plant growth uh, facilities, what, what I usually refer to as the greenhouse. And then later on, uh, what I think is a very interesting uh, presentation by Tom Richards, the treasurer, uh, and uh, Bridgewater, uh, an associate who some of us have been, done due diligence uh, trips, which has some other interesting information. Uh, and we want to have plenty of time for that. We, we have some uh, significant action items, too, which are the uh, uh, 2018 operating budget, uh, the 2018 uh, state capital appropriations request. Uh, we're going to amend, uh, hopefully, uh, or propose an amendment to the uh, investment uh, uh, or the endowment pool. And uh, so we've got a lot to get through, but I think a lot of it deserves a robust discussion, too. So uh, I'll get started, and uh, Interim Vice President Ryan Rapp We'll review the project design for uh, what's referred to as the East Campus Plant Growth Facilities Complex. And again, that's what I would refer to as the greenhouse. Uh, thank you, Curator Steelman. Uh, just to recall, the, the board approved the greenhouse project for MU last October uh, under our collected rules. We're required to bring that back to the board and provide them with an informational update on the project design, and I'm happy to present that today. Um, the project will continue to build on our outstanding interdisciplinary plant group. It's led by Dr. Robert Sharp. Uh, the project will allow for an expansion and improved research facilities in an area of clear excellence as identified by a blue ribbon panel. It'll also help us with faculty and student recruitment and retention. Um, and additionally, the buildings anticipated to be LEED certified, demonstrating our commitment to sustainability. So if, if you look at this, this is just a layout of where the project's going to be. And if you kind of are trying to orient yourself, you've got uh, college over here and stadium is, is to the south. Um, the project is just over 56,000 gross square feet with three greenhouses that have 24 compartments. The design has two compartment sizes to allow for small and large plant studies, including rolling bench equipment. I want to highlight that because it increases our space utilization by 33% compared to fixed benches. Um, it also has a controlled, controlled growth facility that will provide up to 27 growth chambers, which expands significantly expands our current capacity. This slide is, is just showing um, if we were to consider future phases and that was desired and approved, the first phase has been laid out in a way to allow for future expansion. This is just providing you with a closer look at the layout of the facility. It's really the north end of the facility. It contains the three greenhouses, and I know it's hard to see on the screen, but in your mailing it gives you an idea of what the space would be utilized for. And then this is just taking a closer look at, at the south end of the facility, and it also shows where the plant growth facility is located. And if you look at this rendering, it's, it's just showing what the proposed building would look like from the exterior. And finally, here's an aerial rendering from the northwest. Um, this concludes my presentation, and I welcome any questions the board might have. Any questions? I have a brief one. This and some of the new members of the board uh, won't remember the interesting history. This was elevated to a priority by board action and actually was not a uh, unanimous vote at that time. And, and the thinking, of course, was it played into our areas of excellence uh, in plant science. And in particular, we were looking for some signature hires. And Curator Chapman may know something on this. And, and, and Ryan, I don't know who to address it to. Has the fact that this is under uh, uh, 
the planning and, and is going forward. Have, have we got any uh, information back from uh, Kaffner as to whether any of uh, the signature hires or the joint hires with Danforth are making progress? I'll, I'll defer to uh, Chancellor Stokes. Go ahead. Good morning. Um, we are continuing to recruit faculty for our joint Danforth um, uh, hires. And in fact, we were uh, interviewing someone, uh, talking to someone just last week, a really exceptional person who um, we're optimistic about the progress here. Um, I had a conversation, in fact, with this prospective faculty member um, about the importance of these plant growth facilities to her research. And so it simply confirmed for me once again uh, the importance of this investment by the institution in order for us to uh, uh, recruit in this area. And, and I just add, um, I, I know we said it was an area of uh, excellence as identified by a blue ribbon panel. I know when we look at the NSF report on, on research expenditures, they give it broken out by sub areas of specialty. Um, for both agricultural science and life sciences, MU is in the top 10 of the public AAUs. So I, I just want to highlight that is really an area of, of research strength for the MU campus. Ryan, um, you mentioned a partnership with Danforth. Can you give me a little bit of the history on that? Um, I, is there an existing partnership? I know there's a partnership with Umsel and I think MU's. Uh, what I know about that is um, there was a, uh, a plan put in place um, about the time of my arrival at MU, um, as I recall. And uh, it was an initial plan for us to hire four faculty members. Um, two would be housed at Danforth and two would be housed at MU. But uh, the joint partnership provides an opportunity to truly have world-class research and the um, uh, coordination of those faculty with each other. It was just intended to strengthen our capacity to uh, engage in, in research that was federally funded. So currently, we have one faculty member, Blake Meyer, who's been hired jointly, and he is based at the, the Danforth Center. He's a faculty member here. Um, it would be really good for him to have a joint appointment at UMSO as well because we have another faculty member. That's right. Sam Wong, who's, who's split between the UMSO. That's right. So we need to grow this as a system level activity. And the Danforth Center is expanding, not only in the basic science research, but also in innovation and entrepreneurship. And that's an area that we can really contribute. So it's a very exciting opportunity. With regard to this facility, I don't think we would have been able to recruit the quality of dean that we did for Kaffner and Chris Stalbert without the commitment <coughs> from the board for this project. So this is very exciting. Can, can you elaborate, Ryan, on how this is going to be funded? It looks like a $30 million project. Do we have, since, since we've got a partnership with Danforth you know, for human resources, are they going to supply any financial resources to this project? No, I don't believe they are. Uh, when the board approved this, uh, it was to be funded from designated reserves uh, that would it w included funding from UM system, the MU campus, and the college. No fundraising campaign or anything for this project? No, no fundraising for this project. Given our current financial situation, are we going to have some problems moving forward with the project as planned? I, I, I think that's a great question. Um, I, I think it'll really force us to think about priorities, um, but I also think we have to be willing to make investments I mean, if, if in, in signature areas for, for the I, campus. Because the danger is we use this to advertise and get great faculty here and recruit Mr. Daubert, and we get here and can't come through with the project. So. Um, it would be nice. I don't, I don't know where this fits on our priority list as a system. Do you have any idea about that? It, it, it's a top priority project that's, I mean, it, the funding plan's already been approved okay. and we're moving forward. So after this, construction will begin. I'm looking at uh, Vice Chancellor Ward right now. I, I think it begins this in this fall. Okay. If, if I could address that too, Curator. Again, I, I think, again, it was somewhat controversial and not unanimous, but the board at that time, basically by its vote, elevated this to the top priority. And I think it was, I think it was a thoughtful decision, but as we're always trying to figure out if we did the right thing or wrong thing, I rely upon uh, uh, Chancellor Stokes, President Choi, and 
and uh, the dean at Kaffner to make sure and tell us whether this is paying the dividends that we thought it would. So when I hear the term top priority, I hear that a lot, and I, it seems like we've got a lot of top priorities. Are they actually ranked? Is, is this number one? Is this number two? Do we? Can I get a little more specificity on that? Well, well so I, I think um, this wouldn't be on the priority list from the standpoint of it's already been approved. Okay. Um, and, and, and I just want to reiterate, though, even with it being approved, um, one of the things we clearly want to be able to do is invest and grow research. Um, plant sciences and life sciences is an area where we really outperform even the other public AAUs. We're, I, I think we're in the top 10 in that space. So it really is an area that I think it makes sense for us to invest in. And I, and if you don't mind, I'd like to echo what Curator Chapman said because um, as a new board member, you know, when I look through this, and I, you know, they talk about they conceptualized this in 06 and, you know, the Blue Ribbon Panel in 08 and they voted on this in o last October and it sounds like a wonderful project. But I think the challenge I have personally is, as Curator Chapman alluded to, we have a lot of top priorities mm -hmm. and it's like everywhere we go, this is the top priority. And I, I feel like our role in allocating capital is a critical, um, critical piece of what we're going to do and any help you can give us to rank these projects, whether it's, you know, this one for Mizzou or the other one for UM, uh, UMSL or whatever it may be. I, I think that's something that, that would be helpful to me personally. Yeah, I, I think that's a great uh, point. And, and I, I just want to be clear, the, the capital's been allocated for this project, but for future projects, because typically what happens is a project's put on a master plan, that master plan's approved, then it may come through as a state capital request and that gets approval, but then the board actually has to approve the funding and project plan, which that's what was approved in October. So the, any project over five million, the board has to approve at that stage. Um, and if it has any debt financing, for whatever dollar amount, the board has but, to approve but that. But we will bring it to the board with the priorities in place and obviously the board has the opportunity to review it and make its own decision, but we will give you reasons why the priorities are established in the way that they were. But as, as Ryan mentioned, this was voted upon back in October of 2016, and it was deemed the highest priority by looking at the list of projects that came to the board, and the board decided that this would be the number one priority, and that's why it's there. With regard to fundraising, if there is an opportunity for naming rights for this, which will help us reduce the cost of our own investment, those opportunities will be looked into, especially with um, the partnership between Bayer and Monsanto that may materialize, there may be some great opportunities for us to leverage this. So uh, we're, not, we're not shutting out the possibility of fundraising for this opportunity. And you know, may I make a recommendation echoing what Daryl and uh, Curator Layman just said, you know, I thought the MU Health Division just did a great job in opening up with an overview of their financial status. And so going in and understanding how we're operating this year compared to how we operated last year, and then go, realizing this decision was made last year and we're deploying these funds this year, but it just gives us a better frame of reference of what our spend is going to look like over the next 12 months and then what our budget in 2018 looks like. So. I, w I would appreciate doing a little bit of an overview over the financial status going into the launching of the new projects. And I, I think we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, I'll provide that here shortly. If I could, if I could ask one more. And the reason I, uh, again, to echo what we've just heard, the reason I made that statement is because it said the, you know, the funding is coming from design reserves or designated reserves. So is that, you know, could you give me a little more information about those reserves? Because obviously, you know, the, the economy is not great. Yeah. You know, we, there's going to be yeah. continual funding challenges. Yeah. Um, so, so from the system's perspective, we, we have a uh, central bank model, and that's what's providing funding to this. Uh, each campus gets an equitable share in what dividends generated from our working capital returns. So that's where the system funding for the project is coming. Um, MU has reserves that they hold centrally, and then Kaffner also has some funding setting aside that they can put towards the project. And I mean, I'm, I'm all for investing this money. I'm just, you know, I, it, I think it's critical to put that capital where we want to go strategically. Yeah, and I think uh, 
investing in, in plant sciences, life sciences, and growing research is something we absolutely want to invest in. But your point's well taken of, uh, you know, by using those reserves, that means we have to make hard decisions in other areas because we can't afford to do all things. Thank you. Ryan, another question. Can you elaborate on UMSL's partnership in this project? I think you, I think we had said there, or you had said they were partners in this project. Yeah. Please go. Yeah, thanks for, the, thanks for the opportunity to do that. Uh, we, we started this about, I think, about eight years ago, where we identified an endowment, which was provided by Desley, in, uh, by Desley, and then we did a national search for um, an endowed professor, and we hired a fellow named Sam Wong, and he's an outstanding scientist. He interacts with the scientists that are at the Danforth Plan Science Center. They have cooperative grants. Department of Agriculture and National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation. His labs are split. He has half of his laboratories at the Danforth Plant Science Center, and they've just opened up a new building there. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And then his other half of his labs are located on the campus, and it's just a, a great example of a success. I mean, what, what the Mizzou is going to do is elevate it to yet another level with more than one. We just have one professor that does that. Yeah, that's great. And that's just great. And I hope that we can encourage that as we move forward, more of a system approach to utilizing UMSL, which is lo strategically located, you know, near Danforth. So I hope we can, you know, keep keep moving forward with that. And, and Ryan, just one other comment, you know, even though we voted on, I just want to understand this a little bit better. Even though we voted on something, let's say, or the board voted on something, which I wasn't a part of years ago, and then we hit a financial crisis, in in following years, we still it's it's not like that money is still going to be committed. We 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 may have to at some point in time reallocate funds for other priorities at that point just to keep the university running. So so even though this was voted on and we agreed to and the board agreed to pay for it, now that we have a financial crisis to some extent, you know there that may be jeopardized. Is that is that a fair statement or? Am I, I wrong? I, I think that's something we always have to, to think about and find that balance. But but keep in mind, uh, reserves that are being used, uh, when we use reserves, that, that's not a permanent solution. Um, what we really have to be able to find is the recurring dollars to fund our ongoing operations. And so reserves allow us an opportunity to um, maybe pace the change differently than if we didn't have them. But because uh, that's what that's what concerns me. I, I would love to get this project done, but if we just sit back and we're not fundraising, and there is plenty of there are plenty of corporate Fortune 500 companies that I'm sure could make an investment in this. I just don't think we should just sit back and just say the money's there. We already voted on it. I think we should probably be proactive in, in getting funds to to also support this project in conjunction with whatever money the board or the university can provide. I, I think that's great, and, and that's I think what Moon was saying. I think. with what the president said, we'll, we'll continue to look to see if we can fundraise. Any more questions? Okay, moving on. We have it. We have. We're going to have a vote on this. Uh, uh, Ryan, uh, or, uh, Chief Financial Officer Rapp, will uh, now give us that overview uh, on the 2018 operating budget. Uh, thank you, Curator Steelman, and I. And again, this is what we basically went over last meeting, too. Is that correct? Yeah, and it's it's consistent with uh, what the president presented on June second as it related to those plans. And if if you haven't read those plans that are on the website, I'd encourage you to read those. I'd be happy to to go through those in more detail. But I, I think this will provide the overview that Curator Farmer was was looking for. Um, I, I do just want to, before we get into the presentation, provide some context. Um, the budget process and plan is a critical tool for us as a university. Uh, it really is driven by the academic priorities of the institution, but at the same time, the budget should be providing the boundary conditions for what resources are available. Uh, the budget process really isn't an iterative one, um, and we are continuing looking for ways to improve performance throughout the year. And that really is driven by three main themes of either through new revenues, investments with return, or expense reductions. So I just want to be clear that while we're presenting a budget for next year, uh, there's much work that we have to do in FY18 to continue to improve our performance. 
Um, this is just to provide the board with a quick overview of the process that has gone through in developing this year's budget. As you can see, in, in July of last year, the board approved our state operating and capital appropriations request. At the December meeting, our budget assumptions at a high level were delivered, um, and the housing and dining rates were approved at our February meeting. In the April meeting, we reviewed this as an information item, and then the detailed budgets were developed uh, between April and May, and then it shared with the university community on June 2nd. As you think about our revenue sources, um, this slide provides an overview of where our $3.2 billion in revenue comes from by campus or operating unit. Um, and I know we've talked a lot about colors of money um, with green, yellow, and red. I just want to be clear, this is all of it. Uh, this, is, this is what the health system contributes as well. The first two items, um, which are state support and tuition and fees, are primarily in our operating fund or our green bucket of funding. So that's, that's where the academic enterprise is, is housed. Uh, sales, service, and patient revenue is primary yellow, and it's our auxiliary revenues. Uh, this includes things um, like athletics, residence halls. A major driver of this, as you already saw this morning and heard from Jennifer, is our, is our health system. Um, the last two are typically uh, more restricted in their use as they relate to gifts grants and contracts. Um, there is some investment income included in other income as well. This just provides a breakdown of the previous slide in a, in a pie chart and shows it by the colors of money that I've discussed on the previous slide. Um, I just want to be clear that when we think about our $3.1 billion, we talk a lot about our operating fund, but even when we look at the entire current fund's budget, 62% of that is spent on people. So that's either in terms of salary or benefits. 32% uh, of that is spent on other operating expense, and then 6% of that is reflected as capital depreciation. Um, the other operating expense includes things like medical supplies, consulting, travel and training, cost of goods sold is a significant component of that, information technology costs and utilities. Uh, I just want to be clear that for our entire current funds budget, we are projecting performance improvement next year. We think we'll improve by 21 million. Um, that being said, 21 million on a $3.1 billion enterprise is a pretty thin margin. So I just want to be really clear that's why we're going to have to be focused on improvement opportunities over the next year. Can I ask a question, please? Could you go back one slide? So this, you know, this is very helpful. You're breaking out the, the budget. Um, is there a uh, and maybe this, maybe it's just me that this would be helpful for, but is there a way to look at each of those lines more of a, a problem? I mean, obviously we just talked about MU Healthcare, but like of the various universities, it, it, almost like a profit and loss, like a simple way yes. to look and, at Yes, and I have a slide that will end in our operating fund that will give you what a profit loss looks like. And then in the back of your mailing materials, there's actually broken out by the different, the different campuses, but then the different colors of money, there's actually a profit and loss there is, okay. in there as well. So, so, and I'm happy to sit down and go through that with yeah, you. Yeah, I, I would be interested in that. Thank you. Okay. I am going to move on and really focus on our operating fund, but before I do that, I, I did just want to touch on the other fund types we have. Um, the auxiliary funds that I've already talked about, they're the yellow bucket. We expect those operations to be self-sustaining. At the same time, they need to be providing a return to the academic mission. Or I think you have a question of why would we be doing those. Again, that's our residence halls, parking structures, um, and as Jennifer and Jonathan talked this morning, our health system is the single largest auxiliary operation we have. The restricted expenditures. Um, their grants and gifts, um, there are least flexible dollars from the standpoint of they're directed to very specific items, and so we cannot necessarily use those in a way other than what the granting agency or donors intended. Uh, capital expenditures really are budgeted outside of current funds and through our capital budget. Those are approved by the board through our capital plans on a project-by-project -project basis. The endowment fund is invested according to our investment policies, and other than the spending distribution that is provided from the endowment, any of the investment returns we earn there cannot then be used to 
to su supplement our operating fund. So really, we can't touch the corpus of the endowment. So we may have significant investment returns in a given year, but it doesn't mean we can access those. Um, and I, I think I'll just highlight for FY18, we know we're going to have a good year from an investment standpoint, um, but we also have to understand that we can't access those then to operate the university. Ryan, can I ask you a question on endowments? I, you're getting interrupted a lot, but I think the, the state of finances at the state and the university level demands a little more attention uh, than we've given it maybe in the past. The I have been told that our endowment fund is more restricted than a lot of uh, the great universities' endowment funds. Have, do we know if that's right, or have, have we looked at that? Well, we, we don't have an unrestricted endowment like uh, many of the privates do. Uh, we have hundreds or thousands. I'm looking at Tom. I think it's, it's well over 5,000 uh, endow separate endowment accounts. Uh, one of the things we have been trying to do is make sure that when we're looking at new endowments to, to establish a threshold for they need to be of a certain dollar amount <coughs> and establish things like Dean's Excellence Funds, which, which gets to where they're less restrictive. Um, when, when we're looking at new endowment gifts. Any? So, so as we, we move to the operating fund, which is really where we do deliver on our academic mission, it, it is a third of our overall budget, uh, or just a little over a third. It represents 1.2 billion of, of the 3.2 I showed earlier. And again, it is primarily driven by state support and tuition. And, and this highlights the difference in how it's used. I talked about how most of the funding of the 3.2 billion, a little over 60% of that's spent on uh, salaries and benefits. When we think about the operating fund, that number moves to 75%. So when we're looking at our operating fund, um, a much of that is invested in our people. <clears throat> As we a question right here. You, you put in this slide, it's 36% of the total budget. Yeah. And you're, I have a type. One 17, says thirty-seven. It's got thirty-seven percent. Yeah, and that's Which a. It? It, it's thirty-six. It's a typo. Thirty-six. Yeah, I apologize. Just but, not a big deal, but you got two different numbers. Yeah. Okay. Um, as we developed the operating budget for the next year, um, we were really clear that we wanted to look for long-term and, and short-term solutions as well. Um, I just highlight that we understand that to achieve excellence, we will have to find ways to grow our revenue, make investments with positive returns, and reduce spend. It's not, there's no one of those in and of itself will work. Um, to achieve that, we adopted the guiding principles that are presented on this slide, and they really have informed our decisions to date and will continue to guide us as we move forward. This slide reiterates what the president shared on June 2nd and my comments on the prior slide. Um, our budget targets were not simply focused on balancing the shortfalls, but it was also focused on strategically reallocating resources for investment. So I, I think as you look at this and you know, we, we dealt, we're dealing with a approximately $36 million shortfall in state support and $11 million shortfall in tuition and enrollment. And then we do have unavoidable cost increases for things like insurance, utilities, IT cost. But then, more importantly, our, our single largest line item on here is strategic investments that each campus was looking to make. So I think it wasn't just an exercise about cutting, but really about reallocating and reprioritizing. But then as we look at this next slide that does provide a P&L for our um, operating fund budget, I think um, you can see that we've done a lot of hard work, um, but we have many challenges ahead of us. And, and I highlight that because for, for the problem, the 100 million problem we were solving for, 75% of that was solved on a recurring basis. We still have a challenge to solve for about 25% of that um, over the next year. Um, so in my mind, this is just the beginning of the longer term process that will require continued bold action throughout FY18 to find permanent long term solutions to our, to our challenges. Um, but any questions? <clears throat> Just in closing, I, I want to be clear. We, we understand that we still have continued budget challenges in front of us and that we will overcome those. While challenging, I think we have an opportunity to move the university forward. 
Our next steps will include implementing the long-term plans that will drive investments in the academic, academic and research excellence. This will be supported by operating efficiencies and new revenue growth. And I think as we think about where are we going to find that support, um, we're thinking about four key platforms. The first is really as we think about academic excellence. It includes looking at program review. I want to be clear in every campus's plan, they all identified that they will be looking at program review over this next year. I think over the next 12 to 18 months, each campus has a plan to look at their academic programs. Um, the second, oh, let me go back. Uh, the, the, the second item on here is, is revenue enhancement. Um, it's probably our most challenging to find of the four key platforms, but it's also our most lucrative when we do find it. It includes things like pricing flexibility, rethinking our enrollment strategies, and then also looking at our auxiliary operations and what types of contributions can they provide. You, you saw an example of that this morning with what MU Health is doing with the School of Medicine. The third platform we think about is resource allocation and utilization. Uh, part of this is looking at new data-driven allocation models for how we allocate our resources rather than basing it on historical models. Looking at how we reserve practices and how those are handled. Are we leveraging the reserves we have appropriately? Um, and then also one of the things that is, is very important to me is moving away from kind of this annual financial planning exercise to really start to think about a five-year financial plan for the university. I think that's going to be critical uh, for us to think about as we move forward. And the fourth and final um, is, is really leveraging our administrative scale and efficiency and, and collaboration. I, I think one of the things that I think about is the only system in the state, we should be looking at scale as a real competitive advantage. Uh, you can think about that in terms of the academic enterprise, but administratively, I absolutely think it should be a competitive advantage for us. Um, it'll be these four platforms with a continued focus on execution that will drive our success. So I want to be very clear that with the plan we're presenting today, by no means are we saying, well, once this is approved, we're done. We've got challenges that we're going to be working on all through FY18 in each of these areas. Can I ask you, Ryan? What What's the timeline on getting these prioritizations? The, the academic, on the academic program review. Um, so I, I'll provide a summary and then if you want any of the chancellors to provide any additional context on each campus, they can. For s and their plan is to have that done by December of 2017. UMKC has theirs under, it's, on, it's actually in process right now and I think is scheduled to be completed by September. It started last fall. <clears throat> and then MU has launched a committee, and I think it's, it's you, right now over the next 12 to 18 months yeah, is the we timeline. Have a initial deadline of uh, January 15th of 2018. Okay. And then UMSL is, is looking at it, and they'll have it completed by the end of this fiscal year. Thank you. Can I ask a follow up that, uh, that? That's getting, and I, it's, and I am unclear. Does that get us action? Is that the action date? Can we put that on our calendar as an action date? Or is that just to get the recommendations in? Wh when are we expecting that we will see action taken on program reprioritization? For MU, I would say that um, those are recommendations that we'll receive on the 15th of January. And so there'll be a longer term process for actually taking action. If there are changes and consolidations, they will occur at varying paces, depending upon uh, whether we actually talk about uh, the need to uh, finish teaching out students if we're going to end any programs. Um, but the plan is to have all decisions made and implementation certainly begun um, uh, during spring semester of 2018. And, and just to add to that, to be clear, in MU's long-term plan, they actually provided dates on when all of these things would be implemented. And, and <coughs> their long-term plan calls for them finding $21.4 million over the next, it's largely over FY18. There's a few of those that extend out into 19. And then I think with the UMKC plan, it calls for finding $11.4 million, and that would be done during FY18. Ryan. Quick question. So they're gonna, the university or the campuses are gonna 
uh, make this analysis and evaluation and take action in 2018 to, to address the budget shortfall? Yeah, yes. Why not do it earlier? Why are we waiting until 2018? Seems like we've got plenty of time this year to... Well, well, so that was what we did through our short-term plans. And, and so through our short-term plans, we found almost 75 million in recurring reductions now. And so I think now it's to start with the longer term phase of this and say, how do we move forward? And, and to be clear, we're not then just trying through the longer term plan to find just to balance the budget. We're saying, how do we launch these longer term projects in 18? Um, I mean, many of, many of these things that are on the long term plans are already underway. Um, so it's not like, I think it's just that we know it's gonna take some time to get those done, but we're gonna move as quickly as we can because I think, um, especially on the administrative side, uh, whatever we can find so administratively. On the administrative side, we're not waiting until 2018, but uh, on the academic uh, reprioritization, faculty input, staff and student input is gonna be very important. As, as uh, many of us recognize when we decided to close the uh, ag journalism program, we did that pretty quickly based on the metrics, but you saw all of the uh, concerns that were raised by alums, legitimate concerns. So we want to prevent that because it's going to be more than one or two programs that are going to be affected. So getting the buy-in, sharing the data, and making a, making a coordinated effort is going to be key. But once that's done, we need to act quickly. Thank you. In, in closing, I, I, I've already kind of said this, but I just did want to highlight that we do have many projects underway already on the long-term plans. And that I do want to reiterate, while we've done hard work to get where we are today, uh, we certainly know we're not done. Um, we will be adop adapting to a mindset of that we will be alike until we need to be different. Um, and I think that is a big shift for us as a university system. And I think that's where we really can leverage the scale and size of the system and that is a shift from a mindset of I think that we've had in the past of that will be different until we need to be alike um, so I think you're going to see us pushing forward with that over this next year are there any questions more questions or discussion regarding FY 2018 operating budget then uh, May I have a motion? This has to come from a member of the, and a second from a members of the Finance Committee to recommend uh, to the full board to approve that the President of the University of Missouri System be authorized to develop the fiscal year 2018 budgets in accordance with the assumptions that were presented. So moved. A second. Okay. Cindy, would you call the roll, please? Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. <coughs> All committee votes in favor? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might, I move to uh, approve the president of the University of Missouri system, be authorized to develop the fiscal year 2018 budgets in accordance with the uh, assumptions presented. Do we have a second? I need a second. Second. Cindy, we call the rule. Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Farmer? Yes. Curator Graham? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. Okay. All votes in favor. Uh, now, second item, Mr. Chairman, is uh, amending the CRRs for the investment policy for the endowment pool. Ryan will introduce and present the changes uh, that are being requested and recommended to the investment policy for the uh, endowment pool. Uh, Curator Thank you. Steelman, excuse me. I need to recuse myself on this portion. Okay. Thank you, Curator Steelman. Uh, th this action item uh, is, is a follow-up to the information item that we presented in April regarding the spending distribution and administrative fee that's charged to our endowments. Uh, the, the first part of the proposal is focused on changing the administrative fee. We first implemented this fee in FY11, and, and the rate was 1%. Um, this provides an alternative funding source for development. Without it, the funding for development would have to come out of state support and tuition and fees. The proposal to move from 1% to 1.25% would allow an additional 2.2 million per year um, that would not have to be funded from state support and tuition and allow it to remain invested in the academic and research enterprise. But at the same time, it, it'll allow us to continue to invest in raising private support 
at a critical time when we have pressure on these other revenue sources. Um, this, this just provides an overview of what it would provide. We're recommending that the fee be increased by 25 basis points to 1.25%. It would provide 2.2 million to the campuses. Um, additionally, we want to clarify the policy to allow for internal investment, accounting, and legal expenses to be charged directly to the pool. Um, currently, external expenses at this, of the same nature are charged. We'd anticipate this to be two to three basis points, or three to $400,000 a year on a $1.4 billion endowment. Um, so I just wanted to provide this as an overview to give you an idea of what it would provide. The next slide, based on questions we received at the April meeting, I wanted to provide some comparison. What we looked at was SEC schools, Big Ten schools, and AAU schools. And it just is really trying to provide a comparison of what others are doing. It gives you an idea of what the size of their endowment is. What our, for MU, it's the current spending rate and the endowment admin fee. We would be looking to move that to 4% and increasing the endowment admin fee to one and a quarter. This change would be well within the range that's presented here. There's certainly institutions that are higher and uh, there's others that are lower than us as well. Um, The second component of this is our endowment spending distribution. Uh, in 2012, uh, we lowered this from 5% to 4.5%, and we, we accomplished that by holding the distribution flat. Uh, and I'm happy to report that we actually achieved it last year. We were, I think we were given until 2019 to achieve that. Um, and I also want to be clear that throughout that, the spending distributions weren't cut. So distributions that colleges and departments were receiving weren't reduced. They were just held flat. Um, that being said, we still have concerns with investment returns, and we're going to talk more about that later today with Tom and Bridgewater. We believe it would be prudent to lower this from 45 to 4%. Uh, we discussed this approach with all four campuses, and it was agreed that a similar approach that was taken in FY11 was critical to a successful implementation. This slide it just provides a hypothetical example of how this would be achieved, and it just shows how you would hold the distribution constant until you achieved a 4% uh, distribution. Um, this is the same process that we followed when we moved from 5 to 4.5%. This concludes uh, my presentation. I'd welcome any questions. Any questions or discussion? None? I have a question. Oh, okay. Has there been analysis if you bump uh, this fee to how much more fundraising that will generate? Are you saying, okay, this fee is gonna go to support our office and our, our advancement, and has there been a correlation to how much more private investment we think that's going to raise to the fund? So, so I think that's a, a, a great question. I think right now um, we're, we're a little bit above eight to one in terms of for every dollar we invest, we get about $8 back. That's not just strictly for the endowment, but it really does, if you go back, to this slide, the goal would be that if we were to come back in four or five years and show this, that we would see significant movement of MU on this chart. Tom Hiles is here. Tom, would you like to answer that question? Thank you. Uh, as most of you know, we're in the middle of a $1.3 billion campaign that we kicked off in 2015. Uh, during the course of that, we've identified endowment growth as one of our main priorities. So you can see over the last three years, we've been able, with the combination of investments and growth of major uh, commitments like Rich Kinder's commitment of $25 million toward an endowment, to grow over $250 million in a three-year period. So if back to Ryan's point, our cost to raise a dollar is about $0.12. Cents. Um, so we would certainly anticipate these investments having a big impact on being able to grow those numbers. And I know uh, President Choi and I have talked about there's really no reason that Mizzou can't uh, and other, our other systems, um, schools, can't play at a level at the top public universities in the country. The reason our endowment is smaller than a lot of those other institutions is we just started later. We have just as successful and loyal alums and we would anticipate a major push. We've already got a major initiative to, to build the endowment and beyond. So you can kind of extrapolate an additional million and a half 
dollars on what that might look like on a 12 cents to raise a dollar return and we'll benchmark and be glad to come back and talk about that progress of the board. The last thing I will say, the two top rate fundraising publics in the SEC are Florida and Texas A&M. Florida has a $50 million budget all in. Uh, Texas A&M has about a $25 million budget. Our budget is in that $18 million range. So we want to compete at that level, and, and you have to invest. So thank you. In, anything else? No, thank you thank for you. that. Any other questions, discussion? I, I might add, uh, Ryan and, and, and Tom, it, because philanthropy is becoming such a, a huge uh, uh, and significant part of the funding of, of our university and other universities, it might be nice if we could uh, develop some, some uh, metrics or benchmarks and, and maybe report those to the board. And if they come in, I don't see them on somewhat of a regular basis so we can yeah, follow a, that. A, a, absolutely. Um, I, I'm not familiar with what we've maybe provided in the past, but that's something that we could work with uh, each of the heads of advancement on the campus to provide to the board. If there's a consensus from the board, I'd like to ask you to move forward on that. Does anybody okay. have any Certainly. problems with that? Dr. Choi, is that? I guess I'd like to make one more recommendation. I think this pure comparison chart is amazing, but when it comes to an endowment, in my perspective, should we be comparing ourselves to the other SEC peers, but also to just some of the top endowments in the country and how those uh, universities run that program as well? Well, and I, I think it's something, you know, if we ever got to an endowment of the size of some of those top universities, we could probably rethink some of these. Uh, part of it's getting to that size and scale. Um, you know, I, and I, as we touched on earlier, one of our goals is, is to grow endowment accounts that have fewer restrictions on them because we're going to need flexibility in how we can use that funding. Because I, I, I think with the revenue realities we face in other areas, um, we're going to need that type of flexibility. Anything else? Uh, could I have a motion and a second from the members of the Finance Committee? Uh, the shrinking, there's, there's only a couple of you left, to recommend to the full board that changes in, uh, to the collected rules and regulations 140.013 investment policy for endowment pool for the University of Missouri uh, be made as was just described and is in the board materials. So moved. Second. Cindy. Curator Chapman. Yes. Curator Snowden. Yes. Curator Steelman. Yes. Okay. All committee votes in favor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the changes to the collected rules and regulations, uh, 140.013, uh, investment policy for endowment pool for the University of Missouri. We have a second. Second. Cindy, you call the roll. Curator Chapman. Yes. Curator Farmer. Yes. Curator Graham. Yes. Curator Phillips. Yes. Curator Snowden. Yes. Curator Steelman. Uh, yes. All votes in favor. Motion carried. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can we send a bailiff or something to get uh, Curator Layman? Steve, he's coming. Uh, Here he comes. Uh, uh, now, uh, Chief Financial Officer Rapp will review the fiscal year 2019 state appropriations request for operations of the University of Missouri system. Uh, thank you, Curator Steelman. Uh, just, just we, we are required to, to submit this request to the state. It has to be submitted in August. Um, I'll present what we're requesting for the FY19 and seek board approval to move forward. Th this slide just breaks down our request into four components, and I'll go over each one of these in more detail on the following slides. But our, our first priority is to maintain our core appropriations from what we're projecting that we'll receive in FY18. Uh, the, the second is really related to new requests, which includes increasing our core and full restoration of selected line items. Um, other programs includes requests for programs like the State Historical Society, Show Me Extension for Community Health Care and Outcomes. Um, the other is just legislative requirements where we're required to make a request to the state and as I noted earlier, I will go over each of these in a little more detail. Um, 
as I, as I said previously, our, our first priority is to maintain our core from the prior year. Um, and we will seek to have our ongoing special line item programs included in our core. So for activities um, that already have students enrolled, we would like to see those items included in the core as not a separate line item. So if you think about the MU Med School partnership, we already have students enrolled in that program. And when you think about the UMKC uh, Missouri State Pharmacy partnership, we'd like to see those items included in our core appropriation and not as separate line items. Uh, the, the second priority in our request for FY19 would be a 5% increase in performance funding. Uh, we would work, the president would work with the chancellors to identify areas of new investment in academic excellence. So this would include things like research and creative works, student access, success, and outcomes, as well as outreach and engagement. Uh, we'd also like to see restoration of the core line item cuts uh, for the programs you see on this slide. So we, we received an appropriation in, in FY17. It was reduced by these amounts for FY18, and we would be seeking to have those restored to their full amounts. So for the MU Med School partnership, for example, it was originally appropriated at 10 million. We would be seeking to get that fully restored to the 10 million number from the 5 million we're projecting for FY18. This is the other program request that I discussed. Um, these are really other curator programs, and, and we're really seeking to maintain the current amounts, plus a $1 million increase for the State Historical Society. Um, and I want to be clear, the university acts as the fiscal agent for the State Historical Society. It is separate from the university, but we are their fiscal agent. Um, then it includes many outreach programs, uh, like Missouri Telehealth, the Missouri Kidney Program, as well as the Show Me Extension that I touched on previously. The, the final group is a request that we are required to make based on legislative requirements. Um, of these requests, I want to highlight that only two of them come from the state's general revenue, and that's the Missouri Returning Heroes and the Alzheimer's Research Fund. So the remainder of these requests aren't coming from the state's general fund. Um, we just have to make these requests to be able to access the funding. So for spinal cord research, that's a separate fund as well as the seminary fund, and the, the debt offset is just getting authorization uh, to access that funding as well. As far as our next steps, if the board approves this, we'd work to finalize our request and submit it to the state by the August deadline. I, I do want to reiterate what I previously said in regards to the budget, that we will continue to look for new revenues and reduce expenses with a focus on investing in growing research, providing a high quality, affordable, education and also engage in service and outreach to the citizens and industries in Missouri. Um, in closing, the partnership with the state and its financial support are a key component of the university fulfilling its mission in serving Missouri's future. And as part of that partnership, we must do our part as we will continue to make bold decisions uh, in light of the challenges we face. Are there any questions? Any questions or discussion? Well, it won't surprise anybody, I do. Uh, uh, Ryan, I know, and, and even if, uh, I don't know how many of the other curators know, but I know how hard you work to kind of at least stay in touch and understand uh, the state's fiscal situation and the possibility of payments being delayed, withheld, et cetera. And, but of course, I'm not asking you to comment on that because that's not your role, but is there any role that, that is taken into account with, with the state's fiscal situation when we make our uh, state appropriations requests, or, or if not, how, how do we do that? So I, I think that's a good question, and you're probably getting at my, my closing remark that I made of, you know, we very much would, would like to see this funding come to fruition, but given the challenges that we face, that the state's facing, um, we also know we're going to have to look for other ways to fund these programs. Um, so it is definitely something we're taking under consideration, and, and I, I certainly wouldn't want you to think that we're, we're presenting this today and we're going, well, this is a slam dunk. We're, we're going to get this funding. Um, we, we are thinking about what other contingency plans we could need to have to move forward. Any, anything else? Any other discussion questions? Uh, in that case, uh, may I have a motion and a second from the Finance Committee to recommend to the full board uh, that the president of the University of Missouri System be authorized to file a request for fiscal year 2019 state appropriations for operations as 
uh, outlined in the board materials and presented by uh, Mr. Rapp. So moved. I'll second. Second. Oh, go ahead. <clears throat> Cindy, could you call the roll, please? Curator Chapman? Yes. <clears throat> Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. Okay. All committee votes in favor? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I move to approve that the President be authorized to file a request for fiscal year 2019 appropriations request uh, as uh, outlined in the board materials and as just presented by uh, uh, Ryan Rapp. Is there a second? Second. Cindy, right. call the roll. Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Barber. Curator Graham? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. All votes in favor? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as, as is usual with the Finance Committee, we're running right on time. But, uh, uh. <laughs> I expect and anticipate uh, a, a, a robust discussion uh, on the uh, request for capital improvements uh, regarding prioritizations and, and how these are set, et cetera. Uh, I know we break at noon, uh, so I'm kind of asking you, Mr. Graham, how do you want to proceed? Uh, I think we'll take our noon break because I know we have some students, I think, waiting for staff. us. Stand staff. I'm sorry, staff. And uh, uh, more importantly, I would like for the board to give some thought to a discussion I've just in the last uh, hour had with President Choi and a couple of curators. And uh, Ryan, I would appreciate your response to this also. I think in view of conversations and questions we've heard today and conversations we've had over the last uh, several days, perhaps week, perhaps weeks, that it might uh, make sense for the board to appoint a, a committee, task force or committee, to look into the development of a board policy on how we evaluate and have presented to us capital projects and that we find a way to uh, look at them globally. And uh, we've talked about uh, priorities, but to look not just at campus priorities, but how those campus priorities compare to system priorities and other, uh, and to develop, a, and rather than do it uh, piecemeal, as perhaps has been done in the past, to take a more uh, process approach to two capital projects. Uh, so we'll talk about that later in the meeting, but I, I, I do think that that would be something that the university and the board could benefit from. Ryan, is that something that would fit in with the way that uh, you carry out your business? Yeah, I, I think that's reasonable, and, and I think um, it raises a good point. I think one of the things we have to acknowledge that's shifting, I mean, it's been shifting for a long, for a number of years now is, um, we, we might have to think about our prioritization differently because the state is not going to be available to provide the capital support that we need. So I, I think when it was not just for our four campuses, but every institution in the state would submit their capital request, I, I understood that you know you, we could look at it as four separate campuses possibly. But as we're going to be challenged to try to figure out how we fund our capital needs internally, uh, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, this is not a negative comment. It's an observation, and hopefully a, a positive uh, observation. Is uh, it, it probably makes sense for the board to be involved earlier in some of these issues, uh, in so far as uh, anticipating priority issues. So I think that would might be a good idea for the board well, to actually have a written policy on that. I think that's a tremendous idea. You know, we've been having the discussion quite a while. It is my personal belief that uh, capital improvements are a strategic decision. And, and while we talk about micromanaging a lot, that strategic decision, the board should be playing at least a co-equal role, which we haven't been able to do because we haven't had a process by which to either uh, uh, consider the uh, projects, nor have we agreed upon metrics that we've been looking for. It's the uh, board chair's intent to create a committee to look into that and actually report in September. That's fantastic. It, it, and I would just, we've been having discussions, you know, I, I think as we have started to think about this and think differently, um, 
in, in our mind, there's really three buckets as we think of capital projects. There's the projects that the, the projects that we would say are the priority, and we're going to figure out how to do those projects regardless of where the funding is going to come from. And then we then we have our auxiliary enterprises that have revenue they can pledge, so like the health system, I think we do have to think about those differently. And then our third bucket is, yes, we have donors who may be willing to give money for a building, um, as long as we. You know, and I'm, I'm willing to entertain that as a separate category, but it would have to be that they're willing to fully fund the building and help us with the operating cost of the building. So I, I think it's important that we try to parse those out and, and think of those differently. That's at least something we've been discussing internally as we think about this. There being no further uh, business to take care of, the meeting will be in recess.